Today at Edwards, we are celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And when Pastor Jen asked me, uh, I wasn't sure about this, <laughs> but, um, but I agreed. And in the process of writing this sermon, I learned a lot about Asian immigrants to the United States. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen a movie called Gentleman's Agreement. It's an old movie, black and white, with Gregory Peck, uh, which depicted discrimination against Jews in the United States. When I saw the movie, I thought it was a, just a movie title, but I learned this week that that movie title was from an actual informal agreement between the United States and Japan called the Gentleman's Agreement of 1907 which was aimed to restrict the immigrants of Japanese to the United States. Under this agreement, Japan denied passport to Japanese citizens who wanted to work in the U.S., and U.S. permitted immigrants of students, business people, and spouses of Japanese who were already in the United States. I also learned that in October 1906, the San Francisco Board of Education passed a regulation calling for all Japanese and Korean students, along with Chinese students, to be sent to segregated Oriental school. Despite the fact that there were just 93 Japanese students, 25 of whom were born in America, but President Ted Roosevelt fortunately said, called it absurd and blocked it. This Sunday is also Memorial Day weekend. Because of that, we are also remembering those who served this country. Memorial Day was originally known as Declaration Day, and it was established in 1868 to commemorate the dead from the Civil War in this country. Over the years, it came to serve as a day to remember all U.S. men and women killed or missing in action in all wars. Perhaps sometime in the future, I was thinking Memorial Day can be when we commemorate the end of all wars. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> When my son was born, I lived near the mall in Washington, D.C. One day, I put him in a stroller and walked over to the Vietnam Memorial. The black granite walls had names upon names of the dead, 58,195. I had goosebumps just looking at all the names, and I thought about the mothers of those names. And, and I was thinking, what if we pull all the names of people killed in wars, including civilians, would that help stop wars altogether? In recent months, seeing images of women and children in Palestine fleeing war zones to survive has been especially difficult for me. I cannot help but think of my mother who had to flee with an infant, me, to a southern province during the Korean War. She told me how she was on a train all night, and it only went one stop because people are trying to climb on the top of the train to flee. When I checked the distance using Google this time, normally it would have taken about 20 minutes to, to go to that stop. I saw a photo of this scene, people on the top of a train in a Life magazine issue while doing research for a painting I was working on when I was at Wesley. I called the painting, For What? Remember, these people on the train, and it was January, and Korea is very, very cold in January. This week, I attended a presentation about Japanese American experience during World War II. The speaker was Cynthia Izuno Macri, a third generation Japanese American, a retired captain 
who is also an oncologist. She stayed there when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Her father and grandfather was, were living in Hawaii and martial law was declared the same day. She said that the Japanese Americans living in the mainland U.S. were put in concentration camps. Hawaii refused to do that because of the sheer number of Japanese descendants living in Hawaii. If they were all locked up, it meant the whole economy of Hawaii would collapse. Because of that, only Japanese descendants were considered leaders such as civic leaders, teachers, landowners, and even judo instructors were taken to concentration camps. Her father was one of them, and he was sent to Camp Jerome in Arkansas. Her grandfather was arrested and sent to a prisoner of war camp in Louisiana. He was considered an above average threat because he was an educator, and principal of a Japanese language school because he was also Buddhist. The number varies slightly depending on the source, but approximately 1,500 from Hawaii and 120,000 120, Japanese descendants living on the West Coast were put in concentration camps two-thirds of whom were American citizens. I also learned that Hawaii was not even a state at that time. It was a territory of the United States. Compared to these numbers, the U.S. government interned only 11,507 German descendants during World War II, although there were over 11.2 million Germans living in the U.S. I also learned that German descendants were persecuted during World War I, not two, World War I, because of that some German descendants changed their business names to American sounding names, stopped celebrating German traditions, and did not speak German in public to disguise their ethnic identity. Could Japanese descendants have done the same? We know. The answer is no. I came to the United States when I was 14 because of my mother married an American soldier after becoming a widow with an infant, me, during the Korean War. I was born six months before the Korean War. She was only 18 years old when the Korean War started. When I came to the United States, my knowledge of America was nil other than the fact that I knew America helped South Korea during the Korean War, I saw the statue of General MacArthur in Incheon where he landed with United Nations troops. I also saw a few American movies and that was about it. I had no idea that discrimination existed in the United States because of skin color. My first year of school in the United States started in Texas in January 1965. My first encounter with discrimination was when the students were nominating for home, not being nominated for homecoming queen. Two girls in my homemaking class were nominated by one girl who was in the same class, whom I thought was more beautiful than the other two was not, and I felt puzzled. At that time, I thought it could be my own sense of beauty, but I later learned that it was most likely because she was black. When we moved to Georgia, that's when I first encountered a sign, white only, post above a laundromat. With my limited English and knowledge of American culture, I tried to figure out what the sign meant. No one was in the laundromat to ask, so I looked around, and dryers were going with the colored clothes, washing machines had colored clothes, and in hindsight, my interpretation was really silly, but at that time, I thought the sign meant you could only wash white clothes, 
And I included that people were just ignoring signs, and I could do the same. <laughs> the high school I attended was in Harlem, Georgia. I was in the ninth grade, and it was the first year that school was being integrated. What I still remember is a black student coming into our school restroom and, and saying hi to girls there, and no one responding. In my geometry class, we had only one black student, and one day when she was absent from the class, a teacher made some derogatory comments about her. And I don't remember exact words, but I remember thinking, how could a teacher say that about a student? Discrimination against black students puzzled me, and I want to learn why. So I made a questionnaire, gave it to the students I knew. One of the questions was, what do you think about black students, and if you don't like them, why? And one girl answered, because they are different race. I replied, I am a different race. And her answer was simply, you are different. I remember attending a Baptist church in town by myself a few times and wondering how could Christians let this discrimination exist? When I was about to finish my graduate school, I wrote the following for a reflection paper. In 1966, we moved to Georgia. Black students came. I felt the coldness in the air. Slowly, the black students disappeared. I didn't know where they have gone, but I knew why they had to go. Signs, colored, white only. At first, I didn't understand. Later, I understood. Marion Webster Dictionary defines prejudice as preconceived judgment or opinion. An adverse opinion or leaning towards without, without just grounds or before sufficient knowledge. Prejudice is an irrational attitude of hostility directed against an individual, a group, or race, or supposed character. Prejudice is possibly po partly possible because as children, we often learn observing and imitating how others behave. We learn what to do and what not to do. To think, to make matters worse, we are not encouraged to ask questions. If we go against what we are taught, if we go against tradition or the culture, we could easily be ostracized and get into trouble. I remember reading about Chief Justice of the United States, how he, I think he was in Bonn, Alabama, and he actually joined KKK uh, before he actually became the Supreme Court Justice, and then when he became Supreme Court Justice, he, he fought for segregation and his life was threatened. And we also know that Jesus got into trouble with Jewish leaders for not following Jewish tradition blindly. He healed the sick on the Sabbath, which was breaking the Sabbath. He also allowed his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath and eat it when they were hungry. Some of the Pharisees said that Jesus was not from God because he did not keep the Sabbath. When confronted with the question why he was healing on the Sabbath, Jesus replied with a question, quote, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus asked, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life 
or to kill. You now reading from John 14, 27, Jesus said, do not be afraid. And one tra translation used, do not fear. And another, do not lack in courage. Courage is often defined not as an absence of fear, but acting in spite of fear. The Apostle John wrote that there is no fear in love because perfect love casts out fear. And isn't that why when, we, when our loved ones are in danger, our only focus is on how to save them, even if we have to put ourselves in danger? So is fear the absence of love? When describing what happened to Japanese Americans during World War II, an article in the National Archives mentioned fear. Americans feared that Japanese descendants living in the United States would, would side with Japan. Because of that fear, concentration camps were created within two months of the start of the war with Japan. This made me look into how Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month was started. I learned that it started as an Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Week in May in 1979 under President Carter. And it was celebrated from May 4th to 10th. May was chosen because the first American immigrants arrived on the U.S. on May 7, 1843. And the Transcontinental Railroad was finished on May 10, 1869, by a majority of Chinese immigrant workers. The, this week was changed to month in 1992 under President George H.W. Bush. It was a way for the United States to recognize the contribution of Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. During World War II, 33,000 Japanese Americans enlisted in the military and fought mostly in Europe. On July 15, 1946, President Truman welcomed them saying, Quote, you have fought not only the enemy abroad, but prejudice at home, and you have won. Keep up that fight, and we will continue to win, to make this great republic stand for just what the Constitution says it stands for, the welfare of all of the people of people welfare of all of the people all the time. President Truman said, keep up the fight because he knew that prejudice would go on and he was right. It has been almost 78 years since that speech and we are still fighting prejudice. Prejudice everywhere and not just in the United States, and when I went back to Korea to work in 1991, I met a doctor who was Caucasian and married a Korean woman. He was born in Korea because his parents, who were Americans, were missionaries. He said that his wife's grandmother was against the marriage, not because he was American, but because he was born in the Jeolla province of Korea a province in the west of South Korea. When I heard that, I just cracked up. <laughs> I thought the grandmother would have objected to the marriage because he wasn't Korean. But instead, it was because he was born in a province where most Koreans were con considered that province people as stingy. Francis has no boundaries. Although we have a long way to go, I believe God is leading us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sorry. 
and we will eventually learn to live in peace with one another. Over the years, I have visited many different churches, including Greek Orthodox and synagogues. Among them, Epworth is one of the most diverse and welcoming churches. And I'm also very glad that Epworth makes effort to reach out to people in need. These are some of the reasons why we have chosen to come to Epworth. Today's sermon title is, What Do You See? I thought of that because our, our behavior depends on what we think we see. In the book, Seeing with a Mind's Eye, the author states that what we see depends on who we are. For example, a butcher might look at a bull and see beefsteaks. A county judge might see the bull's good or bad lines, and city dweller might see the bull as an object of sheer terror. And if we use this example as a guide, we can easily look at a person and judge that this person is valuable or useful, or that person has no value and is useless. Moreover, if we don't know who we are, we can easily define ourselves by how others define us. One of my so-called bucket list is writing a book, and I thought of calling it My Korea, My America, and My God. Because I want to say that I am no longer defined by nationality, but who I am in God. During my seminary years, I learned about a German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who lived during the time of Hitler and participated in a plot to assassinate Hitler. The plot was discovered and he was imprisoned in a Nazi prison and executed shortly before the end of World War II. He could have easily stayed in the United States to get away from Hitler, and his friends encouraged that, but he went back to Germany. And I would like to read a portion of a poem he wrote while he was imprisoned. The poem is entitled, Who Am I? Our pause where I skip the lines. Who am I? They often tell me. Am I then really what which other men tell of? Or am I only what I myself know of myself? Who am I, this or the other? Am I one person today and tomorrow another? Am I both at once, a hypocrite before others? Who am I? They mock me, these lonely questions of mine whoever I am, thou knows. O oh God, I am thine. I hope whenever we are questioned or question ourselves of our worth, I hope all of us will remember and say to ourselves, O oh God, I am thine. Draw me close to you. Never let me go. Never let me go. I lay 
it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire no one else will do. No one else will do. Cause nothing else could take your place. To feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me 